Hello, everyone. Welcome to Access Chat. Today, we are welcoming Sarah Simcoe, and she has been on the program, I think, before, or we just know, have known and loved her for so long. So, and also, we want to say that Neil Milliken is taking the day off because his wife gave him a very long um, honeydew list, and so he very appropriately is <laughs> going hundreds of miles to go and get um, the different items on the list. So uh, he will not be joining us today. Okay. But uh, Antonio, of course, is joining us today from Portugal. So uh, Sarah, welcome back to the program. I know. Thanks so much for having me back. <laughs> that yeah, means I didn't still... do too bad a job last time. <laughs> no, you did a good job last time. Sarah, do you mind telling the audience uh, who you are and a little bit of your background, um, just to, in case somebody hadn't seen the last episode. But yep. whenever we post it, we'll make sure that we give a link to the episode that you were on before as well. Yeah. So, uh, gosh, the last time I was on was a few years ago now. People, if you watched, if you know my name, you either are familiar with me from my days at Fujitsu. I was there for nearly 20 years. Uh, in the last few years, it was all around diversity and inclusion and disability in particular. Uh, or you may know me from Purple Space. I support uh, Kate Nash still to this day, the wonderful Kate Nash. Uh, and since my time at Fujitsu, the last two years, I dived into the world of self-employment and have been, I've been running a business uh, myself focused on diversity and inclusion and in particular accessibility. So times have changed a lot since I last joined Access Chat. Um, but from somebody who's learned so much from people like yourself, Deborah, Antonio, Neil, Kate, my cabins at Purple, um, to being here now, it's, it's definitely pointed me on my passion path, for sure. And, and I, I, I love Kate Nash. I love it's Kate amazing. Nash. We all love Kate Nash. Um, I, I just want you to tell us what's happening in the UK today. I know that you have the, window, <laughs> the doors opened. And yes. tell us what's happening in the UK today. So if you hear any background noise, forgive me, because I've got the front door of the house is open and the dining room door is open because the Wi-Fi is in the hall. Because today in the UK, it's a public holiday and we're celebrating VE Day, so Victory and Europe Day. So it's 75 years since that day. So given the current um, situation we find ourselves in with uh, COVID, uh, across the UK, people are having stay-at-home street parties where we're literally sitting on our own front in our own drive, so doing all the social distancing, but people having a little drink and a little picnic, and we've got flags and banners and balloons, and um, we're going to be singing We'll Meet Again at nine o'clock tonight, and um, I think in these really challenging times, today is one of those days where we've got an opportunity just to come back together and celebrate something good and great, you know, remind us that there is still something good and great in the world. So yes, if you can hear the noise, my noisy neighbor. Celebrating, <laughs> celebrations and, and we need that. Yeah, yeah and how are, how are you doing with um, the, the walk? I know that um, you unfortunately got bad news yesterday. Yeah, it's been, today's, uh, today's been a difficult day. We lost a friend last night um, and we believe to COVID. Um, and my, my husband had said to me today, you know, do you want to get in touch with uh, the team at Access Chat and maybe think about doing it next week? And because our friend Roy was born without hearing, it kind of felt like it was, forgive, tip of a hat. Well, <clears throat> so we're losing we're a lot of people. Carry on right. through these tears. Um, yeah, we're going to carry on through these tears. And um, this is for him, really. Yes, it is. This is this is why we're doing the work that we do. Absolutely. So you yeah. Honor him. Yeah, you honor him. So, I'm so sorry. Yeah, Thank you. my my um, we lost someone to suicide this week because of just the isolation and loneliness, and yeah. the numbers are really chilling here in the U.S. And um, unfortunately, the numbers are not reflective of the amount of people that are suffering and dying yeah. because yeah. we're you know, we're not testing everybody. And anyway, it's, um, it's just good that the UK is celebrating today in a safe it way. Is. Yeah. I think there's beauty yeah. in life. So, but it's, I think um, there's beauty in it and, you know, we can still do it. We can, everyone's been really safe. Um, 
and and I think you know particularly you know I'm so sorry that you've lost somebody to suicide and you know having lost Roy our friend yesterday and you know our next door neighbours not in, in very good health and just having these moments these small moments to come together and remind ourselves how wonderful humans can be yes. um it's pretty important some days to death. yeah pretty important and i think also celebrating <clears throat> that the and I'm, I'm i'm obnoxiously optimistic even though being an entrepreneur has certainly beat that out of me but um <laughs> Finding the silver linings because actually the yeah. earth is doing much better, air pollution's down, waters are clear. Yeah. There's some really beautiful things that are happening yeah. and all the heroes that are coming out and there's some really bad, really scary, terrifying things that are happening, but there's also some beauty happening. And so, Agreed. yeah. Agreed. I see, I'm, I'm, I'm very similar to yourself, my my glasses usually fall to brim in. Um, and you try, you know, I, the people that I'm speaking to now, as long as we can find goodness in each day. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So tell us more about what you're doing now. Uh, so now I am full time in the work of diversity and inclusion. So um, I've got a business that I'm in with my husband. He's in a slightly different industry. I'm focusing on DNI, uh, and I'm getting to work on behalf of great companies like Purple with my cousin and ENEI for Denise uh, and Kate, obviously at, at Purple Space. Uh, so definitely working into their their end clients, whether it's around access auditing, whether it's how to create inclusive environments. But then the other part of my business is uh, I founded a consortium called Embed last year, a few months ago, back end of last year, uh, and Embed brings together. Uh, other consultants from across sectors where we've got different sector experience we've got different topic experience because one of the things that i'm a huge advocate for is collaboration not competition but for collaboration to bring all that brain power and experience together in really driving forward towards the greater good so embed other part of what i do today is essentially m me trying to make a difference by setting up that consortium um, and, and, and the reason i reached out against yourselves around access chat is, is around that conversation of collaboration. Yeah, we, we totally believe in collaboration here. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's what, one reason why we do access chat. <clears throat> I know that a lot of people are worried with everything that's happening and the downturn in economies and things like that, that maybe I, it's an interesting mix because there there are quite a few people in the united states that think that um companies are really going to pay attention to accessibility and disability inclusion now because everybody was forced home to shelter in place and we saw the you know the lack of access and how it hurts everybody but at the same time um during this time when economies are shut down companies are definitely being hurt and it's going to you know the reality of it is it's going to be hard for them to recover and so on one hand i hear people saying oh they're going to in, in the states they're going to do it more because we're going to sue them um, and then on the other hand the practical realities of companies um, doing whatever they can not to lay off their workers and to, to take care of essential functions and things like that you know i would be curious both from both you and antonio you know what what what, what would y'all predict is going to happen what do you see that's going to happen in the uk and others um i i fear that anytime in my life that i've seen this kind i mean we have traumas and stuff um a lot of times when they say essential things inclusion and accessibility is not considered an essential um thing even though i disagree with that but i was just curious uh sarah what you thought maybe antonio can come in on that as well Antonio, you want to start first because Sarah might be fro. She's might might have um, some internet connectivity, and then we'll go to her. No, what 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 I've seen here is that um, organizations are, are trying are trying their, their best to keep operations going, people motivated through um, uh, through collaboration, to internal learning. They are really trying to, to make the effort to 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 let the moment pass. And then to to return back to operations. At the same time, that that trying to keep energy around business continuity, 
trying to keep their workforces informed about what's going on with, with, with COVID, trying to know the idea is trying to bring everyone together and under them to, to, to keep everyone motivated. Because you know, with so many people working from home, you really need to, to pay that extra care with your workforce to keep everyone engaged and, and, and inform and keep an eye on almost everyone. So I've seen organizations doing an, a kind of a weekly service that they launch to everyone to see, to identify who, who is responding. Because the idea is just to say, yes, everything is okay with that person. And then if someone is not replying, they, they can just go and say, you know, is everything okay with you? And, and in order to be able to provide support. And so that's what, what I've seen here uh, so far. Uh, in Portugal, is a country that heavily depends from tourism. So uh, that sector was really, you know, damaged, especially uh, in the people who, who own uh, services related with tourism, Airbnb owners and, and, and people who have small business. Uh, and the government launched the program to, to, to support them during this, during this period. Um, it will help, but I don't, it's going to be a challenge uh, over the next coming months. Tourism is not going to recover um, in two, three, four months. It might take a year, it might take two. So people really might have to rethink the model of their small business. That's where, where I see some of the most, you know, worrying uh, issues. Yeah, well said. And Sarah, I, I, um, I know your internet's going in and out, so yeah, we'll talk around it because we want to hear your wisdom. Um, so I think if, I, if I've caught most of what you said, I think in the UK, what I initially, uh, I noticed there was a bit of how do we just keep the lights on? How do we keep business going? How do we shift? The way of working but as time goes on what we are seeing now is organizations and individuals realizing we can work in a really different way so they're far more embracing of tech as an example you know accessible assistive tech or they're far more uh, accepting of different policies that are going to allow people to work from home in a far more accessible and uh, remote friendly way so I think initially it was, oh, you know, where's this going to go? How are, gonna, how are people going to react? Now we're starting to see people really having those moments of creativity. And as we're starting to prepare for post lockdown and, you know, organisations are starting to think about how they're going to open back up. Actually, we're starting to see them going, OK, so the things that we've learned, the different creative ways we've been working, there's a lot we can take forward. So I'm hopeful that's going to continue in post-lockdown world, whatever that's, whatever that's going to look like. So I think it's been, um, it's been a moment where if I could find a silver lining when it comes to accessibility, it's that people have had the opportunity to really kick the tires of what it means to think inclusively and accessibly. I, I, I think that uh, for many years organizations say, well, we don't have time to do that experiment, we can't do that, you know, the CIOs will say, oh, no, that's a security risk, having people working from home. Yeah. And, and sometimes knowing that that's not really true, but they were, they were playing sometimes on the securities of uh, old ways of doing IT. And now this forces everyone to move into that space and people are realize, yeah. well, after all, it's possible, you know? Yeah, um, absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and there was, you know, there was people that I've done work with directly who prior to this were kind of, I want to see the whites of your eyes. I want you in the office. I don't, you know, we'll, we're just going to have to go. Now, those are the individuals that I actually feel are becoming um, the, the drum bangers, the, the people that are kind of, the light bulbs come on and we know you're absolutely right. We know we can work in a, in a really different way moving forward. So my hope is that that stays post lockdown and quarantine, whatever we're all calling it around the world. I hope that stays because there's been so many wonderful lessons learned, ideas created, uh, really great examples of collaboration rather than competition. And um, so, so my hope is that that carries forward. So Sarah, you mentioned that you brought together a group to collaborate. Yes. Will you tell us the name of that group again and just tell us a little bit more about it? 
Yeah, so the group that I put, brought together, I've called it Embed. So literally embedding change. So I've called it Embed. And it's a consortium that is underpinned by services and offerings that we've made uh, the, the purposeful decision to ensure that they're accessible in the truest sense, but they're also cost accessible, um, that there's going to be no restrictions if an organisation is small or uh, cash strapped. So we're trying to be super accessible in lots of different ways. But the one thing that it does is it brings it brings in together around eight or nine independent consultancy, small consultancy businesses together where we can learn lessons for what's happening in housing or what's happening in heritage or what's happening in tech. So all of the people within the embed consortium have got different areas of experience and expertise. And what I found in bringing those people together when I'm then serving, because that's ultimately what we're there to do, right? When I'm serving an organization or an individual, I've got this great opportunity to leverage all of these skills and experiences and lessons learned from this, this consortium of really super talented people who have been around and have done it all. And the one thing that they have at the heart of everything that they do is their desire to enable people, to empower people to make our individual experiences, whether that's one of disability, whether that's one of the LGBT community, whether that's race, whatever that inclusion aspect is those individuals that we brought together at the heart it's all about how do we empower people which has been it's been special to watch right and the intersectionality of oh. diversity is just so power you know, powerful yeah. and I, I know that that's always the way i've operated i've always been about collaborating and supporting and not worrying so much about oh i can't work with you because you're a competitor because what we often see, I know I work with a lot of large global corporations and we cannot be everything that they need. They're moving parts, like you were noting, transportation and housing. And, and there is a lot of moving parts to assure we all are included. And Antonio was mentioning early cyber, earlier cybersecurity. I mean, yeah. there's just so many moving parts. And often, I know so often what's happening in the United States is not just in the United States, but just looking from my lens for a minute, you know, one company will come in and they'll, they'll say they can do everything for them when they can't. They're experts in accessibility, but maybe they don't know how to include people with disabilities in the workforce yeah. or how to really accommodate them. And what, how does this yeah. tie to transportation? There's a lot of nuances because accessibility is certainly for everybody. Yeah. So the more yeah. we come together to collaborate, and like you said, I think there's real power in bringing small teams together, small businesses, individuals. We are a gig economy, and you know I think that adds a lot of value. So I, I think yeah. it's a proven model, and it's a model that's yeah. really needed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I have the pleasure of working with clients in, in, across all sectors. And what I see is competition sector to sector, not, not with everyone, not with everyone, of course, but a lot of competition sector to sector, but also within sectors. So organization to organization within sector. And actually in the moments where, you know, a consortium like Embed goes in, it's all about collaboration. When we go in and start having a conversation about what we're actually talking about, that it's not just something specific to a museum or to an art gallery or to a housing association or to a bank. When you unlock that in the conversation, then when we wrap around, it, it just it changes the tone, it changes the direction of travel, um, and it changes the level of commitment you then see afford within those organisations. So, yeah, like I, I learned a lot from Access Chat back in the day in Seed. So uh, collaboration definitely. I agree. And, and there is so many different moving parts. It's, uh, I'm taking notes because I'm responsible for the questions today. But one of the questions I'm going to ask is, you know, you know, accessibility is a really broad word and it really impacts a whole lot of different things. And I want to bring Antonio in to make some comments if he wants to make some comments here. But one thing that um, I've seen is that I, I have been I, I feel like a lot of us have been reminding society that accessibility benefits everybody. And as we all started rushing home, those companies, well, we were already teleworking. So we, 
it, that didn't impact us at all, but there were so many that didn't. And I remember um, a few years ago, the CEO of Yahoo decided to, to, and took away all teleworking from the company a few years ago. Well, you know, what companies are finding now is by everybody going home, employees are actually being more productive. Now, whether or not we're seeing innovation, creativity, I'm sure we are, but how do we measure that during a time of pandemic? And, um, and once again, Antonio, please, if you want to pop in, because I always love the way Antonio's brain works on these, um, these topics, but it, it's a fascinating time because we can't go back. We're not going backwards. And I'm hoping that companies are not going to be silly enough to say, well, even though it's been working fine, you've been da 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 da, everybody come back and let's start doing yeah. what we were doing before, which, by the way, was killing our earth, um, making climate change worse, hurting people. But um, Antonio, let me be quiet and turn it over to you and then you that can uh, I, turn I it over. have different services being done in different locations. And uh, more or less every survey is telling us that people don't want to return back to the way of working from the past you know uh, some there's the majority uh, wants to work from home probably they want some people some organizations might not be able to let people working from home all the time but definitely people start to work from home more frequently than ever in the past because some arguments against remote work uh, that were already, that were basically arguments that were there, but were not really proofs uh, that remote work was not working. It was more kind of a bias against remote work. I think mm -hmm. now the barrier is down and, and people can actually make the case for remote work to work because it's yeah. possible. It can benefit people. It can help you with your work-life balance. Yeah. And uh, I was uh, reading a, a, a some tweets from Tom Peters that I re really like. Um, and Tom was saying that, well, the, the time that you are taking care of your kids, the time that you are supporting a neighbor um, or talking with a friend, that's part of your life. That's also work. So uh, the life is blended. You cannot just say, oh, uh, uh, what he was trying to do is you need to put out that pressure. Oh, now I'm at work. Now I'm a parent now i'm a husband now i'm the handyman no you, you, we need to take off this this kind of uh, pressure and mm -hmm. then do it people will be more you know uh, be able to feel more themselves when they are at work and they don't feel that you know uh, what i would say a syndrome that they are not actually delivering that they are not working when in, in fact they are yeah that, that you make such a great point about well-being in, in, in all of that when you when you consider that that balance and and, and to your point so I, I see I see moments of people being creative what I what I, do I worry about it I probably do worry about it I probably worry that right now people focusing on you know the tragedy of everything that's happening and keeping the lights on and keeping the business going and I get that you know we're paying bills we're paying salaries I absolutely get that but don't drop the ball on the agenda of accessibility and inclusion, because right now, more than ever, to your point, Antonio, more than ever, inclusion is such a critical component of those organisational strategies, because the way in which the, the, we're shifting our home life balance and people are working more from home and we are taking a different approach to how we deliver services more than ever, that inclusion aspect and the ability for us to be super accessible is such a hot topic that I don't want organisations out there to continue to feel it's a nice to have. It's a must have. And, and if this doesn't prove that even more, I feel like I'm going to get a soapbox out now from under the... <laughs> no, but I agree with you. I agree with you because accessibility when you... And I understand we're all... Because I'm a business owner. Everybody's yeah. looking at the essentials. I just made a, a decision... Um, you know, to about my company, you know, and to spend money on something that I was like, nah, and I thought, okay, yeah. no, you need to spend money. Because, you know, right now in this new world, 
you're afraid to spend money. You want to draw back and hold on to that money, but um, sometimes you have to invest in the future. I mean, often you should invest in the future, but I know that we were thinking um, as societies that working from home was could be an accommodation or an adaption, you know, using the language I'll use in the UK. And um, I, there was actually, there's, um, it, I forget which agency, one of our government agencies in, in the United States has a policy for all of the government agencies in the US that, that says um, letting someone telework is an accommodation and yeah. um, that they recommend, but the reality is, it accommodates all of us. I, I like the point that Antonio was making that you can't just label us. Now I'm a mom. Now I'm a wife. Now I'm a caregiver. Now I'm working. It drives you a little crazy doing all that. Yeah. So remove the labels and understand we're blended human beings with yeah. a lot of different things. And, you know, having more time with our families and getting off the roads unnecessarily. Why do we all need to go to this one place when a lot of people are, most people are working independently anyway. Come together when you need yeah. to, but don't force people back on the roads for no reason. It, it just doesn't make sense anymore. And continue to focus on accessibility because accessibility makes the world work, technology work for all, all people. But I wonder, I, I hope that we won't go backwards, that we will be smart. And also, what do you do? I, I Obviously, I, I spend too much time thinking, but I think, you know, there's a couple of things I'm wondering about with all these offices that people aren't going to use. Well, there's a lot of homeless people all over the world. Why don't right. we be smart yeah. about how we're using buildings? Yeah. I mean, and then I have people, you know, asking, <clears throat> you know, what's going to happen to these gigantic conferences that, you know, uh, Antonio and I were both going to go to a conference in um, Barcelona that they were expecting between 100 and 150,000 people. And it got canceled appropriately. But do we need I mean, I don't know this answer. Do we need to have conferences where there's 150,000 people? Deborah, the challenge there, know. the challenge there is that is in fact relates how business do business and, and how they do sales. Uh, some organizations they are heavily depend heavily depend from that type of model. They are not able to sell or do business in any other way. You know. Uh, right. They put together their nice brochure, you know, print everything, give it, and they, they really depend on that. Yeah. And, and for many years, they have been, oh, digital, no, one day we'll do it. You know, it's, no, we, we, it's still working for us. Uh, and now this, but some companies in, in a difficult situation because they don't know how to sell. In, in a different way. Yes. Yeah. Well, right. Do it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and they have they might have a workforce of 300 salespeople and they have about 10 who know how to drive into this world. The the other 290 are just uh, you know working from yeah. home. What do I do now? I have the email and now how do I reach yeah. my customers? You know, so yeah. they don't really know how to adapt. So uh, so at the same time, conference organizers are also some of them they they, they have a business. Right, right. You know, this is an industry. So, this uh, is an industry. Some of them, I'm sure they will be able to reinvent themselves and find a way to bring this into a virtual format. Others won't be able to do that. No. No. And, and, and I think that's the big message, isn't it, Antonio? I think, and, and, and I think we're all banging the same drum where it's possible to embrace that different way. Where, hello, where it's, um, where it's impossible to embrace a different way of working. We, we can only do it where we can do it, but I think my encouragement is for us to look more broadly of where we can realistically do that. I mean, I do a lot of coaching. I do a lot of facilitation like you guys, and I've managed to do that remotely over the last few weeks. I've appreciated it with having my own conditions, I've got to say, <laughs> not traveling so much, but it's possible. So I think my, my encouragement, and, and I'm really looking forward to the, the Twitter chat, is how can we collaborate better to learn the lessons to ensure that where possible we can become more um accessible or, or considerate of different ways of working where it's appropriate for sure yeah 
I agree. So I have a, I have a question that I'm going to, I sort of dragged Antonio into the interview and um, I always love when um, his beautiful daughter photo bombs us. So <laughs> it's always a treat. I know. <laughs> but so how can the accessibility industry help these corporations and these industries as they try to reinvent themselves because the the beauty about accessibility and all these amazing leaders that we have in accessibility is that we do understand the value of digital inclusion and digital access and we understand you know there are experts that understand how the cybersecurity and all the moving parts associated with this can help a corporation be more successful. So I really believe that we are needed more than ever in these conversations yeah. because we understand how to take the extreme users and make sure they're included, the vulnerable yeah. users and make sure they're included. And there is a benefit to everyone else. But let me um, let you answer that question, Sarah, and I don't know if Antonio wants to come in after you. I, I completely agree. I, I think in, in order for us to be able to influence it, because I, I think you're right. I think we, the people within this community doing the, the jobs that we're doing, trying to encourage the conversation we're trying to encourage, have to be at the table to have that conversation. We have to be at that table to be able to influence. And, you know, there's, there's lots of great people helping to uh, open those doors already. The great work you're doing, Deborah, the great work, you know, the likes of the great Caroline Craig Casey does, you know. We, but we need to be at that table and we need to be at that table now as they're starting to consider what that's going to look like post lockdown. What are the things that we need to encourage those organisations to consider? Um, so, so for me, that's the point. It's, it's being at that table. It's having the opportunity to be up front and centre in the conversation. I mean, Antonio, I, I don't know if you have a, a different view. No, I, I, I agree. Uh, I, I think it's uh, uh, it's it's uh, I see this as a kind of a, a, an op an opportunity uh, uh, for change, and and something that I, I I've seen uh, within organizations, our own and and many others, is how uh, people that they that working work for the organization and now that they're coming together to solve common problems to to reach out to each other. Uh, in the way that probably they were not doing in the past, they were not searching for that colleague for in order to collaborate, in order to solve that problem. So yeah. collaboration is improving in, in inside organizations and outside and outside organizations. There's a good number of projects trying to address the needs of different people. You know, I, uh, all over all over Europe, you know, go and and do shopping for elderly individuals go to the supermarket collect and go and distribute that to them others trying to reach out where are those individuals who are living alone how can yeah. you reach them in and, and and see if they are well so i think there's it's bringing up some of the best of us uh, so there's there's a, a kind of a dark side behind it but there's also this where people are rediscovering themselves and rediscovering the other yeah, yeah, I like that. We are, aren't we? We, we are rediscovering ourselves. Yeah. Yes, we are. Yeah. And what's important. So I know that we're out of time. So I'm going to do two things. I'm going to thank our wonderful supporters. And then I want to turn it over to you, Sarah, for final words and for you to tell the audience how they can get in touch with you and, um, be, you know, this consortium, Embed Consortium that you've created. Um, and then, and, you know, so I, I wanted to let you think about that because that's coming up but first of all we want to we want to thank 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 barclays access we love you so much for supporting us and my clear text which is amazing and keeps us fully accessible and microlink who are wonderful wonderful people and we just really really appreciate our supporters they are there for us and they're for they're for our community and we're just so grateful for everything they do um so now let me give you the final word sarah words up uh, so thank you for having me. Uh, my final word would be a, a word of encouragement or an ask, an encouraging ask uh, is for people to consider what else they can do around collaboration. Um, when we when we think and, and when I say collaboration, I mean in all the various shapes and sizes it comes in. So whether it is the 
the suite of community-based moments where we collaborate and help each other in these current, uh, current unprecedented times, or whether it is you're thinking of your own organisation post lockdown, consider collaboration and look for opportunities to collaborate with organisations or individuals similar to yourself, whether that's to learn from each other, whether that's to come together and agree different policies and ways of working or ideas around accessibility or, or what post lockdown planning is realistically going to look like. My encouraging ask is that everyone seeks opportunities to collaborate. There are wonderful forums like Access Chat that underpin those conversations, which is essential. You've got consortiums like that to help. But I think that my, my ask is those encouraging conversations to break down barriers um, and to use collaboration to help us all do that. To get in touch with Embed, you can do so by going to our website, so www.embed.org.uk, uh, and the email is info at embed.org.uk. And thank you so much for letting me come back on. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank it's you for being on the show. Talking to you. You. Yeah, and we're glad you're safe. We're so sorry about the loss of your friends. We, um, we're praying and sending light to everybody. We got this. We'll figure it out. We're stronger together. Yeah. And it's, it's a new world. So let's invent it so that we can all be included and all have access. Um, uh, and, and thanks so much, guys. Please stay safe. Send in much love. Thank and, you. And, and before you go, let me know. We never met the two of us, right? Face to face, right? No, never, never. Uh, no, and, and the fact that this is, also, I just want to close with this. I think it's also very interesting that that doesn't create any barriers in the way how we collaborate, how we engage, and now we we like each other. We are not, I would say, we are not the closest friends in the world, but we we are we synchronize in the way how we think in the things that we like, and we. We keep this kind of a digital friendship that is as important as other. I agree. I'm, 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 I've never met Deborah either, and I've worked with Deborah a few times now with Purple Light Up in, you know, the wonderful Ms. Nash. Um, really great point, though. No, I'm, I've met Neil once, I think. Right. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, great point. Well, on. one of one of my closest friends is Doug Foresta, and I have worked very, very closely with him weekly, daily for years and I've never met him in person. I've never met him in person, but I, I don't care. I love him. So yeah, uh, great it, doesn't, it yeah. doesn't always, and it's wonderful when we get to meet person to person in flesh, but you can have really powerful. I think that is a very good point. You can have powerful relationships yeah. and um, virtually, and you can the planet and we can all be included. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you for your work. Oh, no, for thank your, you. We're fans and we appreciate you. Oh no, thank you so much. Today. Keep keep doing what you're doing, guys. You're just brilliant, all of you. Thanks so much for having me. Please stay safe. Send in much love. Thank you.